Okay, so we resume basically where we left off uh, in lecture 30 uh, when we started discussing well separated pair decomposition. So, uh, so given a point set S, right, we want to generate pairs A i B i such that A i intersection B i is that is there disjoint and for all um, let's say P one sorry P i P j belonging to S there exists some uh, A k B k such that P i belongs to A k and P j belongs to B k. Right? So, every pair of points that you can generate from the given points at S, we should have some uh, this pairs of sets A i B i. Right? So, we want to generate pairs of subsets right? uh, such that these properties hold. Right? So, every pair uh, P i P j should be uh, present in one of the pair of subsets that we are generating. Right? And the, the, the well separated pair part essentially is that um, the diameter of the subsets okay, should be small compared to the distance d between pi. Okay, so, more you know, formally what we want is that max of um, say um, uh, let, let, let us use uh, something like delta for the diameter, diameter of A i B i okay, should be less than or equal to epsilon times distance between A i B i. The distance between a, a two, two subsets of points is the closest pair. So, you know, so if, if you have a i, you have they are disjoint. Remember that, right? So, the dis, so the, the the pair of so there are some points that lie in these two sets. You have to look at that pair of points that are closest, and that defines the distance between the subsets a i b i. So, what we want essentially is that the diameter, so it should be uh, it to scale it should be like this, you know the, the distance okay, should be much bigger compared to the diameter of the points, so the spread of the point sets. And what it allows you to do is uh, if you since the, the, the distance is much la larger, so this is dis the distance, okay, if you take any pair of points. Okay, uh, so, the distance between any specific pair of points okay, you should be able to approximate by d because this is very small compared to the distance. Right? Yeah, right, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, 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 yeah, exactly. I didn't know.
So that is that is a basic reason why you are doing all this. So that even if you take two specific points, the, the distance between that pair is not much different from maybe another pair of point that you may have chosen or some representative points that you choose in the two sets. Fine. So, uh, this thing, this uh, epsilon uh, well separated pair uh, construction uh, or the generation of the subsets will begin or the algorithm will start with essentially uh, with, a, with a compressed quartry. So, assume that we have already constructed a compressed quartry on the given set of point P. So, in the in the last lecture, we discussed how to how to efficiently construct a compressed quartry of a given set of points. And I will actually retract something I said on that particular lecture. Uh, that is, uh, uh, so so if you recall, the the construction went something like this. So we we defined something called these canonical grids. Okay, which were basically powers of two grids, okay, and then we defined our cells based on the canonical grids, right? And when you do this quartry, so so first you you know this is the enclosing square of the given set of points, and then you generate these, then this quartry. So this is the your root node, and you generate this uh, four cells, okay. And you keep generating them recursively till you know something is empty, and then you don't generate anymore, right? So that was the initial thing. But that meant that you know we could go, we may have to go very deep depending on the dimension of the uh, of the of the of the unit square to begin with, right? So the the depth of this tree would not be bounded if we just followed this construction, right? And then what we did was we compressed that, right? We compressed these paths. You know, if you have paths having just one child. We decided to compress the whole thing, okay. And by compressing the whole thing, we could argue that the the depth would not be more than logarithmic because at every point there will be branching of at least two, right? And every every root uh, leaf node co corresponds to exactly one point of the uh, exactly one point. So the uh, we, we we stop basically when a sub square contains exactly one point that becomes a leaf node. Uh, so so for going from quad trees quad trees to compressed quad trees we managed to uh, basically um, um, bound the depth right so this has a bounded depth so let's say about log n right. but then uh, uh, we also made use of some property uh, when we were discussing just the uh, just the original quartry and that is that when you want to search for a point okay we could do something like a binary search uh, to to find out which uh, which is the basically the path taken by in the original uh, quartry which is the path taken by a point okay so that we could do find out by doing a binary search on the on the uh, on the path itself okay so if the path length was p okay in log p time one could actually do a binary search by, by figuring because we could use the hashing right so we could we could uh, find out exactly at depth d so okay at depth d which cell which cell contains the query point p Okay, so this one we can simply, you know, uh, just just have a function that defines it, right? So you know that at at because this is a, uh, you know, we are sub subdividing the square into exactly four parts. So at depth d, we know exactly which cell is supposed to contain that point. Okay, now, uh, so so if that square is actually present, okay, then. We, we hash it if it is not present okay it means that you know uh, the the point must be present you know uh, higher up in the tree and if, the, if, if that square is present then you have to go lower down in the tree so that's how we are doing the binary search c 
see when you have a, uh, a, a, a the full quad tree defined okay you know, you know exactly because of the way we are subdividing the square which square would occur so in, in the given tree where so this square should occur maybe at level 1 you know some other square so at, le, at depth d we know exactly where is a square is supposed to occur if that square is present okay now that may not be present at all because the uh, the 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 construction stops when we have uh, when we we have empty cells or basically we stop when there is exactly one point right so when we are trying to find out find out uh, do some kind of query for a point p to find out which cell contains this point p among the cells that are actually stored we only store the non empty cells right so to find out which cell contains this point p we could do a binary search on the path itself because we at depth d i know which cell is supposed to point, contain that query point uh, p now if that cell is and we are storing all these cells by hashing okay because we know exactly the dimensions of the square or the address of the square so we could actually hash it so if that square is present we know that okay we need to go further down deeper down into the tree to find out which cell contains the point if that square is not present it means that the the that path stops much before that because you know it, it has become empty so by doing a doing a binary search of this form is that cell present that is basically given a depth d is the point occurring before the depth d or the point is below the depth d so we can actually locate that cell that's the whole point so we could do a binary search on on the on the path itself okay so if the path has uh, so p is not a good notation maybe i should use q q here so if uh, if the path is p okay the length is p then we could do this kind of searching for or uh, for a query point q in log of p time using this this uh, whether it's present or not is it deeper than d or is is it it occurs before d so where does the path basically end right at some point see this you can infinite simile divide right but you stop when you have an empty cell so how are you finding the path which contains the point is it given to you or i mean you said that i uh, given i can do the but how do you know uh, okay so the original see ori the originally the the quad tree if i don't compress it okay it's like a complete binary tree right it's like a complete binary tree and you can go to infinite depth so given any cell you know exactly where it should be present it's like a complete binary tree now instead of storing it in a tree fashion we are actually hashing these things that's all but i can compute exactly at depth d okay given any node at depth d what what should be the address of this so i'm going to hash it okay so if i'm trying to find out for a query point q okay q is here you know at what point basically we start stop of dividing i am doing essentially a binary search on the depth that i have to go still uh, uh, before basically the cells become empty right if if q is if you know if if some there is some subsquare okay where q is present okay and after that you divide okay you are not going to divide any further so it should stop here i am not going to divide this cell any further okay but i don't know initially what is the depth at which this q is stored so i'll do a binary search on the on the uh, depth of that uh, where the the point q is likely to be stored okay and with that i i can cut down my search time to so if the uh, if the uh, quad tree has depth maximum depth p or h let us say height then i can do it in log of h queries okay now where uh, i there was a slight oversight when we went from the this is the uncompressed quad tree the moment i compress the quad tree then i lose the ability to do this binary search because i don't know okay compressed quad tree basically means that i compress these paths right and different paths have been compressed in different ways so i don't know which exactly uh, uh, which of these may not be consecutive nodes right because i have already compressed them so i lose my ability to do the binary search right so this is where you know there was an oversight uh, that how do you then actually uh, uh how do you actually do the searching uh in um, so we we found we we well when you when you do the uh 
look at I think we have to go back and see what we did actually. No, no, no. So there, there is a problem. The height. No, no, no. So that that is very many mistake. The, the the depth is not the depth is not bounded. The size of the the tree is bounded, right? Sorry. Because that at every node there is at least a branching of size two. So okay, you can only partition it n minus one times, and therefore the size of the quarter, compressed quarter is bounded by order n. But this doesn't give you give you a uh, bound on the height, right? So no, no. So that is when we assume that uh, we have a bounded spread. So I'm not assuming bounded spread. Okay. So. So what what happens then is that your tree has uh, log n as n nodes, but it can be very skewed, right? So you could have a situation where you know you are just moving along something like this. You know, it could have a branching of two, but it could have a long path. Okay? So a compressed quad tree could have a long path okay? or long path. So this is where we have lost our ability to do searching quickly in log n time. Right? We could construct this tree in n log n time. That's what we discussed last time. Right? So now going from a, a a a tree of this kind, a compressed quad tree, to restructuring the tree. So we want to restructure the tree. To enable fast order log n search okay so there is some data structure tricks that we require and which is something that i don't want to get into today uh, so if you are familiar with things called finger search trees how many of you heard about finger search trees so well okay so i see most heads moving this way so finger search trees actually allow you to start searching not only from the root node but at some selected points called fingers. It's like that if you have some extra information instead of starting from the root, you can start at a more convenient places, and these places are called fingers. Right? The, so finger search trees, you know, in many situations allows you to do fast searching, and this tree can be restructured, okay, using the same notion as finger search trees. And that requires a fair amount of discussion, which I can't get into today. Okay. So let's only let's just 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 assume that this tree can be restructured in a way which will allow which will support order log in query time for uh, when when you're doing a point location to find out which cell contains this point, a query query point Q. We can do this whole thing in log in time after again we research restructure the compressed quad tree. Into a finger search tree. So finger right. search nodes on the tree, selected nodes that you. Right. So we do discuss this sometime? No, I don't think so. Not, no, no, not in this course. So we can discuss it out uh, offline okay. separately. Right. All right. So I will. So this is because you know last in the in the end of last lecture, you know I realized that you know I I I didn't quite complete the discussion about how do you how do you do the order log n uh, bounded uh, compressed quad tree. Okay. So right now we will begin our discussion by assuming that we have a compressed quad tree that has height log n after we have restructured the compressed quad tree using some finger search tree uh, techniques. Okay. Is there any proof that this finger search trees are yes. Well, finger search trees is a generic family of trees. For this particular restructuring, uh, what you would, what we will do is we will take a tree and you know we will we'll use the notion of what is called tree separators. Okay? So you can separate out trees into two more or less equal parts and, and restructure so that the finally the height becomes just about logarithmic. Okay? So it is it's not very rele relevant to what we are discussing, not, certainly not geometry, it is a data structure trick. Okay? So I am skipping it for the time being and I actually do not intend to even return here. Okay, so let's go back. So 
So, what we have now initially, so, so we will assume this that you know we have given for the given point set P, oh sorry S right, S, S, we have constructed a compressed quadri tau of order n nodes and order log n depth. Okay. And this construction takes, if you recall, this construction takes n log n time. So, our starting point for the well separated pair decomposition is this compressed quadri tau. Okay. Now, let me just first write up the algorithm. Um, let me step back, let me step back because with this just to think I should clarify if one thing before we do this. Okay, so, when we define actually the well separated pair decomposition, we are talking about diameters of point sets A and diameter of point sets P. Okay. So, presumably and also distances between two subsets of points. Now, if you, if you somehow you know we construct this decomposition, it appears that we need to know how to compute the diameter of a point set, right. Else how would I even verify whether something is a well separated pair decomposition. So, I should know how to compute distances between two subsets of points and I should also know how to compute the diameter of a given set of points reasonably efficiently otherwise I will be stuck just with that. Right. So, to circumvent this problem there is a clever trick that is used. So, we actually will never compute the precise diameter or the precise distance between two subsets of points. We will assume, see we, we started with this quadri, what does quadri do? Quadri actually def, def, uh, you know um, partitions the space into cells, right and these cells are basically these orthogonal kind of cells. The, 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 the discussion that we will, uh, um, that we have had previously, uh, you know goes through any dimensions. So, it is not specific to just two dimension. Now, I have been drawing my pictures in two dimensions, you know the squares and subcells and subsquares, but actually the same thing goes through in any dimension. Okay. In fact, our well separated pair decomposition will also go through in any dimension. Okay. So, what are we doing? We are, we are given uh, some set of points, we are enclosing the points in some cell which is which is basically nothing but a square of certain size. Okay. So, suppose I have these two sets of points okay. let us call it A and let us call this B. Okay. Now, if I were to actually verify whether A and B satisfies the definition of uh, the epsilon uh, Pair, well separated pair, then I should know the diameter of A, I should verify the diameter of A 
or let us say the max of diameter of A and, and diameter of B, okay, both should be less than okay, the distance between the points at A and B. So only this, then I will, uh, will be convinced that yes, you know this this constitutes a legal pair of the well-separated pair decomposition. Now instead of that, suppose I do the following: I just assume that my the the diameter of this point set is the diameter of the cell enclosing the uh, point set A. Okay. So suppose we approximate. the diameter sorry delta A by, so let me use this notation um, so this is nothing but uh, the cell enclosing points of A. Similarly, you know I can approximate the diameter of B by the cell enclosing the set of points B. Of course, the diameter of a, strictly speaking the diameter of a square is probably the distance between the two uh, diagonal points, but it is something that you know is a formula essentially. If I tell you the side of the square, you know exactly what the diameter is. Okay? I do not have to actually do any computation for that other than just applying the formula. Okay? Similarly, I will I can approximate the distance between the point sets A and B by the distance between I can say distance between A and B okay I can uh, uh, is, is certainly less than or equal to the distance between the cells okay and even here maybe I should point out that the diameter of the cell containing the points that say actually is greater than or equal to the actual diameter of A, right? Because it encloses the set of points. Okay. Now with these approximations, if you can ensure that So, if we can ensure that this is less than or equal to epsilon times distance between the cells, this will guarantee that the points are actually well separated. No, no, distance between uh, this point sets is you know some it is a point on the boundary, right? How can it be closer no, than that? Okay. There is a point in the boundary. No, no, yeah, so this is the cell is this, the cell is this entire, you know, if, if you think about it, the cell is this entire thing. But, so, so there is, there are uh, at least one point of A and one there point is, of B. No, 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 there is no point of A or B. Okay. When we are talking about cells, it is basically the, the square, the entire square, the area of the square. Right. So, uh, so if I if I give you two two squares like this, what is the closest point? You know, it, whatever it can be point. It has to be a point on the boundary of the square, but there is there doesn't have to be any point of A on the boundary. What is the what is the distance between two spheres? Two discs. See, I could have also enclosed the same thing. I could have I could have enclosed it using using uh, you know some some enclosure like this. Then it would have been. Uh, the the distance between the two discs. The distance between the two discs has to be less than or equal to the distance between the point sets A and B, right? Because the disc actually encloses the point set A and the point set B. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So what what is it? Oh, sorry. Thank you. You are absolutely right. Okay. So, if you can ensure that this 
the diameter of uh, that, that this condition holds, then I claim that they are actually well separated. Okay. This condition is nothing but uh, delta A over d a b right. So, we are taking a lower bound on the and I want this to be less than or equal to epsilon right. So, if this by is less than epsilon then this quantity should also be that right because we have chosen a higher numerator and a larger denominator. If anything we are actually more strictly imposing this, we are approxim approximating it, but we are approximating it from one end. So, if this quantity, if this term is less than let us say our parameter epsilon, let us say 0 0.1, then the actual uh, ratio should be certainly less than 0.1. Right? So, this is how we will avoid actually doing explicit computation of the diameter which is not such an easy, well it is easy in the sense that you know I can take every pair of points okay, and find the distance, but that is an n choose 2 kind of computation and we do not want to do this n choose 2 kind of computation at many steps of the algorithm. Okay? We want, we will actually get a much faster algorithm than that. Okay. So, with this background then I can write down the algorithm. So, recall that tau is our compressed quadri, right. Okay. So, this algorithm WSPD takes two parameters u and v, okay. these are supposed to be some point sets. Now, if u equal to v and delta u equal to z, delta u basically means that the diameter, well it is a way of writing that it is a single singleton point, diameter can be 0 only, only if it is a singleton point. So, if that is the case then you know we do not proceed any further, it is a recursive algorithm, so this is a termination case basically. Else, um, this is just to get the ordering right. So, I want my first uh, subset to have a larger diameter than the second subset, that is all, does not do anything.
So, u v now becomes one of the pairs of the decomposition. because it satisfies that okay, the condition of well separateness. So, we call it recursively. So, this is the only place that we call it recursively. So, if the condition, so we are, so it starts with two subsets of points u v, okay. Initially, actually, u equal to v equal to p uh, s, okay. So, this is my algorithm, okay. The algorithm ends here, okay. So, initially, u equal to v equal to this point set S and we are always referring to the compressed quadri tau. So, what happens? So, you call this algorithm initially on u u okay, or the root of the tree which is the root of the tree. So, ignore the the one singleton point case, you know, there is nothing really happening with the singleton point. Otherwise, if these two, we initially it is u u, okay. So both of them are same. Now uh, clearly, this condition cannot be satisfied. Just look at the first step. Okay? This condition cannot be satisfied. They cannot be well separated because u and u are the same set of points. Obviously, they can't be separated. Okay? So what are you going to do? You are going to call the algorithm recursively on u comma all the children of u. Okay, Let us just look at this. So, here is the root of the tau, this is my tau, this is u 1, u 2, u r, the children of the, the, of the root. Okay. So, when we called it initially, we are calling this as u u. Okay. Now, that cannot be well separated. So, we are going to call it recursively on all the pairs u 1 u this is how it is going to progress after the first level. Now, you can see that again u 1 and u, they are not going to be disjoint, right. So, nothing is happening even in the second level, right. u and u 1 are not disjoint because u i is actually a, a subset of uh, u. So, nothing is really going to happen there. But the next time again, you are going to see this one will give rise to, let us say, look at any arbitrary thing. So, this one will again give rise to things like w s p d ui, uj and things pairs like that. Now, ui and uj may be actually separate, I mean disjoint pairs and then you will check whether or not that condition is satisfied. If not satisfied, it will go further into the, you know, it will go down the tree basically. So, the algorithm is picking up the recursive calls from the structure of tau, okay. The algorithm is not really proceeding down the tree or anything like that, no, not strictly down the tree. It is a sequence of recursive calls. Okay, and the next set of recursive calls is picked up from the structure of the tree. Well, it, it is not specified, you know, whether it will, you know, it is just that finally the WSPD is going to be the union of the pairs returned by this and this and this and all that, but in, in, in whatever sequence you call, it is not specifying any order as such. So, actually, it is a very simple 
simply stated algorithm, but it may not be very simple to visualize what is really going on. How are you going to compute each node? This tree is given to us that right? we have already done the quadri, compressed quadri. So, tau is the compressed quadri. It is given. We have first constructed tau. That is our pre-processing. After we have got the tau, then this algorithm looking at the structure of tau will, you know, it is a re recursive algorithm where the recursive calls are generated depending on the structure of this, of this tree. Does it terminate? Clearly, it must, right? Every time you know it, it, it is not a well separated pair, we are actually looking at a subcell of that. So, at some point, the cell is going to become empty or the cell is going to become a singleton element and it must terminate at that point. So, termination is not a problem, okay. Will it produce well separated pairs? Yes, because it is not going to print out anything till it is well separated, right? So, that only in the step 2, it is printing out something, otherwise, just calling recursively. So, the interesting things about this algorithm really is how many pairs are produced, pairs of subsets are produced, okay, and what is the running time. So, how are we going to argue about these things? We have already done n log n work to construct the tau. So, I will first write down the claim and then we see whether we can justify that. So, we start with the root of this unit, root of tau, root of tau, So, if you consider that d is fixed like you know 2 or 3 or some fixed constant, okay, what it is producing is actually a linear number of pairs okay. and the most uh, you know frequent use of let us say you know WSPD is actually in Euclidean spaces of you know dimensions 2 and 3. So, d is, is a constant in all such applications. Okay. So, it is actually producing a linear number of pairs. but you know it also depends on the epsilon. So, if you if you want uh, epsilon to be smaller, it is uh, it is going to basically work harder, I mean it, it will require more time to converge. So, why is it that? So, if you want you know points to be sort of well separated in the sense that they are really sort of small and further apart, okay, then you have to work harder intuitively that that should be the case, right. I want my diameters to be small. I mean, I don't. It is like you know. You are. I, I mentioned right in the beginning that you know it's used for applications where you're trying to compute some pairwise interactions. Okay, 
and those approximations become only better if you know the, the points are actually the sets are actually further apart because then the approximations you know whatever Taylor series you do will come out to be better if the point sets are actually further apart. So, the smaller you specify the epsilon to be in, in terms of any kind of you know, uh, you know calculations that you do in physics okay, or, or, or yeah, basically physics or chemistry. The, the, those the, the forces the terms for the lower order terms for the forces etcetera will be even smaller. Okay. So, with smaller epsilon actually you get better approximations and you also have to algorithmically have to work harder to produce that kind of decomposition. And this n log n, this n log n is uh, uh, this is coming from the uh, the construction of the quad tree. So after the construction of the quad tree, the time that it takes is only linear in n, and of course you know it's also it depends on the epsilon. But if epsilon is you know not that small, suppose epsilon is 0 0.4, 0 0.5, that kind of thing, then you're essentially looking at linear time starting from the quad tree. So, how does one prove this bound? So, there is of course, you know a, a fairly elaborate proof and I do not want to write out everything in the class. I uh, will probably give you some pointer, maybe I will put it up on the on the course page itself, the, the, the proof, uh, the, but let me just discuss the idea of the proof. Okay. So, there are a couple of observations okay, that is crucial. So remember the canonical grid is that you know it is that you know I, I take a grid spaced 1, then I take a grid spaced half and I take a grid spaced 1 fourth and so on and so forth. Right? So at any fixed level of the grid, okay, uh, uh, the number of cells at a distance D from a fixed cell can be bounded by Well, d is not a good because I am using d for dimensions at a distance, let us say, r. So, essentially, you know, if you look at a two dimensional thing, all we are saying is that you know, I fix suppose this is u, this is a cell containing u, okay. If you go distance. D uh, R from here in whatever direction. Okay. So, of course, you know this is nothing but a, a disk okay. and the number of cells that intersect this disk is no more than what is given here. Um, I have a feeling that I may have to multiply I may have to multiply this by 2. So, all I am doing is I just bounding it by this this thing. Okay. So, this is distance r. So, it should be probably 2 r. Okay. Sorry. So, what is to be noted is that it is essentially distance over the size of the cell to the power d in dimension d. Okay. 
where is the observation going to be useful okay. The way you want to analyze this is that you look at any sequence of recursive calls. Suppose I have u1 v1 to u2 v2 to u3 v3. So, when you go through this recur the sequence of recursive calls it basically means that and we stop here. So, no pairs are generated here because if, if some pair is generated then you stop it terminates. You, you go further look at this algorithm. So, you go further only when you know you do not this, these two pairs of points are not well separated okay. only then you go deeper into the recursion and force you call it on all the children of, of a certain node right. So, you, you do not actually generate anything in the middle okay. and at some point you are generating some pairs okay. So, here you have generated some pairs essentially the US VS is a pair right US VS is a pair. So, what it means is that uh, the can I say the following that the number of recursive calls um, can be charged to the number of pairs generated. And we want to also somehow, so we want to basically count the number of pairs generated, okay. We want to count, to count and to count the number of pairs generated. charge the pair generated to the node of tau that was the last called recursive procedure. Uh, last call regard recursive uh, the last recursion the last recursive call so so we have the recursive calls are basically structured on the on on the way the tau is basically uh, structured right so we uh, if if you don't produce a pair then the next set of recursive calls basically go according to the children of that particular node where that recursive call occurred right. So, when, whenever we produce a pair okay, we want to charge it okay, to that node of tau okay, because of which this pair got generated because of which recursive call this pair was generated. Okay. And then what we will do is we will count the total number of 
charge is accumulated at each node of tau. So that will give us the total number of pairs generated right? and the key lemma would be that this is again stated without proof here, the total number of charges in any node of tau is order 1 over well actually to be more precise it turns out to be more like 2 to the power 2 times d divided by epsilon to the power d. Now the 2 to the power 2d is actually ignored in the final bounds because d is considered to be a constant. If you, if you consider d to be fixed then you can ignore it otherwise this is actually the quantity 2 to the power 2d. So there is an exponential another exponential also. Right. So this has to be argued. So if we can argue this then we get the final bound. Okay. So time is up today so I will continue this, this discussion tomorrow.